Welcome everyone to uh, an interview with Michael White, one of the co-founders of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, Mike has done some fantastic work uh, researching uh, protest movement. Uh, his book, uh, The End of Protest, was one of the key texts for the, the starting of Extinction Rebellion. And it's a real pleasure to have him on uh, our new online program uh, switching online <laughs> in the in the height of the coronavirus um, to have a talk with him today about the coronavirus and social movements going forward. Micah, welcome. Thanks, Robin. That's awesome. Can't wait to talk to you guys. Great. And also here today, yeah, so my name's Robin. I'm, uh, yeah, one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion here in the UK. And we're joined by Dahlia too. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dahlia. I am part of Extinction Rebellion, mainly working with communities, connecting the beautiful communities, um, loving all the communities. And I'm also part of a working group called Movements of Movements, which is now both of these groups are so important right now, connecting the communities and building movements that are big enough to tackle what, what is ahead of us. And I'm very excited to see Micah again. Last time we met, actually not that long ago here in Bristol, but it seems um, a lifetime ago. <laughs> and when you came to Bristol, you just came back from Davos. And yeah, do you want to continue your introduction? And I'm in Bristol, where the sun is shining. <laughs> One thirty post-lunch social movements for the main cause. <laughs> nice. Yeah, do you want to go ahead, yeah. Mike, and pick up where we left off? When we yeah. Off yeah, so basically, yeah, let me tell you this, so the trajectory of like how we've gotten to this FaceTime or this Zoom call, because it's amazing how much, how quickly time is moving right now. One of the things that the virus is doing is, is accelerating time. It's accelerating, um, it's moving so fast, it's doubling every three days that there's just so much happening. So. My basic trajectory is, you know, I um, was invited to go to the World Economic Forum back in the old world, to the end of the, the last, the, which will probably be the last global uh, meeting of elites that's going to happen probably in 2020, um, was it, or in January of 2020. And then on, while I was there is when the coronavirus started to really pick up and I started tuning into it because what, ironically what happened is they had this huge contingent from Tianjin, China because the World Economic Forum does a annual meeting in Tianjin, China. And I was, I remember I was Googling on my phone, oh my God, how far is Tianjin from Wuhan? Because I never, you know, are these people like, I, and it was, so it was on my mind. But then I went to London to meet with XR people, Robin and Dahlia and others. And on the, on the plane ride back is when I started to like really be like, okay, there's going to be no protest happening this year like I went to UK talking about trillion trees and environmental protests and I left the UK being like there's going to be no social protests at all and I kind of just like went down the rabbit hole and so um I spent a lot of time thinking about I think one of the things I, I said you know very early on to myself is like that I didn't want to just take my previous thinking and apply it to the new situation which to me doesn't work it feels like coronavirus is fundamentally something that is totally new. This is a totally new situation and we need to bring totally new thinking to it. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I had started very early. So when I launched Flu Mob on February 26, I had already been thinking about it for three or four weeks, thinking about what's the right kind of approach here. And still we ended up being one of the first kind of activist um, groups to, to talk about this. And when I sent out, the first thing we did is we sent out basically, um, so we have three principles. Uh, one is protect the uninfected. Number two is serve the infected. And three is accelerate positive change. And so the first thing we did is I sent out basically a, a stockpile guide to people like, here's how to stockpile three months worth of food. And, you know, I got this email back from someone. They were like, are you telling me to panic buy? This was in February 26, 2020. And I wrote back to him like a couple of days ago. I'm like, how are you doing? And he's like, I'm in lockdown right now in Ireland. So it ended up being for those people who got that email and followed through, I think was really timely. So what we're trying to do at Flumob, just to bring it, you know, it's, we're trying to stay ahead of the virus, which is very difficult, by giving people the information and resources they need to be ahead of the virus so that we can kind of um, 
you know, lock in the positive social changes that are happening. Like one of the things that's amazing about the situation is that like when I was in the UK, it felt like it was impossible for us to reduce carbon emissions by 7.6% this year. And already it seems like, what? That's going to be easy. I can't wait till the end of this year when they're just like, yeah, carbon emissions are down 15%. I mean, it's insane. We have never seen this amount of, I mean, there's, there's no flights. It's, it's, it's crazy. So that's a really positive and awesome thing. Everyone's working from home in some ways is really great. It comes with some, some bad sides too, but so I'm, I'm really, um, yeah, trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, make those positive changes permanent. I think one of the goals we need to do as activists right now. Yeah, sure. Because we're all now in lockdown, but how long does the lockdown have to persist to rewire an entire society? So, yeah, you said the landscape has changed beyond anyone's imagination since Davos. And I also hear that you don't think there will be any other gatherings such as COP26. Um, that seems to be an impossibility. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think so. I mean, it's, it's really tricky because predictions are hard. I think one of the things about the coronavirus so far is that the worst case scenarios have always turned out to be true with this particular virus. Uh, and that's what's been really interesting for me because so, you know, I've been really reading in the Reddit. That's how I got the main information. And, they, you know, they would have these videos of people collapsing on the street in China and all this kind of stuff. And then people say, that's fake, that's fake. And then, of course, the virus spreads to Iran. And then it, we see people collapsing on the street. And then it spreads to America. And we see people collapsing on the street. So there are things about this virus that they are not explaining or talking about openly. And one of them is that the virus seems to have neurological consequences. So they're talking about it now. Oh, maybe it impacts your, your smell or your taste. Um, but we also like, there's just so much more about the virus. So right now it's not feasible for people to gather <laughs> within 10 or 15 feet of each other, which is, which is tremendous. Um, so yeah, it's really, I think that, I think that one of the things that, that I, that I want activists to do is, is we need to prepare ourselves emotionally and psychologically for what is to come and kind of like not listen to the mainstream narratives because the mainstream narrative has been wrong about coronavirus since the beginning every single time that's what's so um amazing so one of the things that's going to happen i think activists need to prepare themselves for is that and this is from if you go on the flu mob site there's actually this report from the who that they published two or three years ago and it talks about what are some of the core assumptions you should have about a pandemic situation like this and one of them they say is that there's going to be multiple waves so that so the first thing is th this is just wave one so we'll get through wave one and maybe we'll feel better. There will be a second wave. We can almost guarantee there will be a second wave. And with the Spanish flu, the second wave was more lethal and it started to target a different age group. So we don't know long-term the the lockdowns could be a, a kind of indefinite strategy, which comes with, the second thing I'll add though is, which comes with a lot of psychological trauma. So that's gonna be another whole thing that we need to figure out, which is that being in quarantine is psychologically a traumatic experience. There's been scientific research on this question. So you're really already going into this sort of what, what are your personal concerns due to this COVID-19 crisis on personally, but also looking into the political um, landscape and, and perhaps also your hopes, which is part of your sort of the third pillar of um, flu mob, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's really tricky because I think that there, even though coronavirus is everywhere, it is definitely impacting different societies slightly differently. So I think that, for example, like in China, I don't think there was, I don't think there's a single report of like panic buying of groceries. <laughs> like, I don't, like literally, it just, I don't think it happens, you know, like, and so. Why, why this, do you think that is? Well, I have this friend in China and I kind of like have been texting with him a little bit. And he, he says like one thing that's really shaping their experience is that they lived through SARS. So like they went through, you know, this is like SARS too. So they went through a, a re an infectious mm -hmm. respiratory illness and they adopted these behaviors and, they, and they, they were traumatized by that. But I think they're much more quick to like, like go right into that. They like, they experience, they know how to do it. So I think in America, at least like we have no experience. And I can see that because no one around here is wearing masks at all, like zero mask usage. Um, people are very naive about the infectiousness of this. Someone, it's important to be realistic. This has been called the most infectious respiratory illness in human history. Like, and they don't, which is very confusing because then you're like, well, is it measles more infectious? And I don't know that, but this has been multiple people called it that. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think in terms of like my, my fears, I think in places like America, my fear is that our leadership is so terrible on this issue that I think there's a risk of social breakdown. I do think that there is a real risk of like, 
people want to, the problem with Trump is that he's telling people what they want to hear, which is, this is not a big deal. When what they really need to hear is this is a really big deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like in China, what they did, what got me like taking this seriously is they literally, there's videos, they literally locked people in their homes from the outside. That's how big of a deal this is. This is so infectious that they were like, we need to lock you in your house. I think until other people are taking it that seriously, it's not going to go away. So the one problem is, is the problem of like, is there going to be a social kind of breakdown, which could be a bad thing or a good thing. Um, but I think in, I think the other big, big question here is that we're seeing already, we were seeing kind of the end of politics, but now we're seeing the end of politics, like writ large, which is basically elections are off. Like they're having in Israel, you know, the, the person who lost the election is still in power because of coronavirus and they can't get them out. Like they, they even had a protest. It didn't work, you know? So we're having a situation where everyone who's in power now is going to stay in power. And that's ironically, that's the same thing I was talking about um, during Davos, which is like, um, there's no time for like politics is over. There's no time for dreaming about a political revolution. And then we're going to take power and then we're going to deal with the climate crisis. It's even worse with Corona. There's no time to be like, oh yeah, we're going to overthrow Donald Trump institute a new government, set up a new CDC, then deal with coronavirus. You're like, really? Even if that takes 30 days, coronavirus will have, will have doubled 10 times. So we're stuck in a situation where politics is over um, because of the nature of the crisis. We have to work with the people who are in charge. But that's very dangerous because the only solution that seems to be working is an authoritarian kind of Chinese response. So the virus is having massive kind of implications for, for everything. They're even talking about um, another data point for people to think about is there they're actually talking on a global level of instituting global cell phone monitoring to track the virus. So they're going to, they're basically, they're, the surveillance state is like all of our fears on that direction, it's happening. Like it's going to be unbelievable because, because it's the most effective way to track the virus is to be like, well, we can then find out every cell phone that was around that person, et cetera. So. Um, it is, but where, where does democracy sit in that? Well, I think democracy relies on the public sphere and there is no public sphere anymore. We are in our homes. You can't, like, out of here in New York, it's illegal. I believe it's illegal to have a group more than two people or something ridiculous. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't even have, you can't even have two people on the street. It's illegal. So the idea of having any sort of democratic engagement is, is done. And in our country, in America, we don't even have the infrastructure to do mail-in voting in every state. Like, there's just complete, it's completely not talked about. But they, they canceled some primaries. The Democratic nominee is up in the air. Like it's, un, it's unclear what they're going to do. It's unclear if there's even going to be able, be able to have an election. So democracy, democracy is basically effectively suspended. We're in a state of emergency with suspension of, of a democracy. Um, yeah, so, so what it's really- kind of, What kind of leadership, um, when we are talking about social movements and how limited we are now within this crisis to actually think about having a social movement, how, what can a social movement look like now? Because people are rewired, people are in a state of emergency. We do need to work with the leadership that's um, in, in power now, but we also need to be careful, you know, who's picking up in the little in the little cracks who are these folks and how can we then um still because there will be there will be waves and there will be a post corona nine uh, uh covet 19 phase one what is the landscape we are finding us there and to not let you know within the emergency builds there's so much stuff that's slipping through now so we need to still take the power and there is uh this is asking for leadership so where do you think, um, what, what's our power here? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I think that one thing to do is, you know, I got these emails from some local like daycare, people running daycares in my local community. And they're like, we want to run emergency daycares. And I was just like, you can't. This is, I think the first thing is we have to have a realistic understanding of what we're capable of doing in this situation, which is that this is so infectious that even people wearing full protective gear in hospitals are being infected in record numbers, like nurses, doctors, infected, ha and they have equipment. So this is not something like, like, you know, in Occupy's history, we have something called Occupy Sandy, where after the hurricane, we all went out there and was like mutual aid and helping people. This is not that scenario. This is not that scenario. Even though I wish it were that scenario, it's not the, that scenario. 
So I think that in terms of my thinking about what we need to do, I think that we need to be a little bit more like Silicon Valley. If you notice what, what Facebook and all those companies did is they immediately shut down and protected their organization as, as much as possible. So we need to protect the activist networks that we have by keeping our members safe for as long as possible. How? Because we need to, well, first of all, everyone, I mean, honestly, we need to stay, we need to stay home. You need to stay home. Everyone has to stay home. That's just the truth. We need to keep, so the first goal is to, to protect the uninfected by remaining uninfected, by giving you the resources and, and knowledges you have. So like, if you don't have a mask, you need to figure out how to make a mask. If you need to go out, you need to wear a mask, et cetera. Um, the, and then the second thing is like, to, to, we have to serve the infected. But again, it's a, it's, it's a question of like, who should do the serving? I think that we should push, we should not be naive and try to take on tasks that would decimate our organizations and leadership like so we need to do things that we can do without being infected but i think what i'm trying to say is that the likely scenario according to who is that we should assume that in the first wave of the pandemic response um, our resources and consumables will be exhausted which means that when this when the first wave of this is over there will be no more no more masks there will be there will be a lot less uh canned goods there will be a lot less of the things that we use in order to fight there'll be a lot less money et cetera, et cetera. I think that is the point in which once we've protected our organizations, then we have an opportunity to act. So that's what I would be saying is that we should be thinking long-term. I think that we should, we should not fall into the trap of them. Like Trump is trying to convince everyone it's gonna be fine by Easter. He can say those lies, but it's not true. What's more important is to think about what is our, what is, how do we protect our organization in the long-term and how do we, how, how do we maintain ourselves as in strength so that we can come back when when it does actually peak and when it is down and then we're the ones who are like okay like we put aside whatever two weeks of food for the time in which the second wave hits or whatever so it's that kind of deep straight strategy that i would like to i'm see. hearing i'm not sure if you're aware of that but in the uk um is something called COVID 19 uh mutual aid which is have you heard about it it has mobilized or in the in its register 2.5 million of volunteers who have organized on a street to street level and boroughs they have no other demand other than community support in their direct neighborhood you know if there's an older person that needs medicine being picked up it's quite extraordinary you know this has grown within i think the last six weeks from nowhere to 2.5 million and they do nothing else than um, supporting their, their immediate neighborhood. And now the government last week has called upon some of these volunteers to support them with perhaps um, delivering food packages and, and these th sort of things. And for example, the food banks obviously are in great demand right now because zero hour workers run out of money within a day or two. You know, they don't make it till the end of, of the week anyway, in good times. So this is, this is really hard. Um, so that's great. For us as an organization, as XR, the question is, what, what, what are we going to do? How can we support, how can we support um, the people? In, in, in any way. And that's not taking on, you know, I'm not an NHS nurse, so I'm not going out to do that. But people need, need support and need to be held. And there are scares around, um, yeah, what, what are the powers government is picking up now that we will then still have in place once we land back in, into a more healthier environment. Yeah. Um, okay. No, I'm with you. It's it's a very difficult um, thing because we, in a time of crisis, when pe when our neighbors are being hurt and all this kind of stuff, we want to be the ones who step forward. But I would just say, I would use a metaphor from war, which is like, like there's all these examples of like, when there's a, a military advance on one side, the other side can act very naively. So for example, like there's stories of cavalry charging against machine guns. So there's a kind of heroic suicidal gesture that we can make in these times, because it's like, you know, like, I need to do something. I'm going out there right now to go deliver food door to door, get infected, and then be not helpful in three months when we really need. So I think that, I think that what, if, I, if XR, XR's gift should be focusing on, look, like coronavirus is achieving everything we wanted environmentally right now. So 
there's going to be already in the U.S. tremendous pressure, like there was in China, to restart the factories, restart all that stuff. That's what we need to start preventing. Like, we need to, like, be the force that's like, no, we don't want to go back to work. We don't want the planes to keep running. We don't want any of that stuff to start again. Like, we want, we want to eradicate coronavirus, and we also want to stay out of that old world. So the best way to do that is we need to protect ourselves. The, let the state, let the state get, it, get infected. Let the other people get infected. But right now, I think that it's like, we want to be around for pandemic wave two when they're like, we need to get the factories back to work. But, we, but at the same time, this is like a war tame scenario and like they can do things like they can force us to, like there could be drafts, you know what I mean? Like they can force people to, they can force young people to deliver food if they wanted to, they could do that. Um, so, but what I would say is like, and it's, I think it's, it's harsh, but it's like protect the organization. You know, just like Silicon Valley did, Facebook and Amazon, they all were like very early on, they canceled everything. They said, come home, don't travel. It's the same thing for, the, for us to stay as activists. We wanna, another way to look at it is we wanna increase the percentage of the population after wave one who are activists. So the number one way to do that would be to spread activism, but also not get infected. <laughs> you know what I mean? So so. How, how would you spread activism? Because by the end of, let's just call it, by the end of phase one, people, have some more appreciation for wow so air pollution dropped but they will also be in financially potentially in quite you know difficult positions and health-wise there, there are many families who are losing family members you're talking about the trauma we're talking about mental health issues addictions vulnerable people who are exposed to their abusers, domestic violence, all these things are on the rise. So there is, that's infecting, you know, it's basically highlighting all the issues in society that we've always been talking about. The poor people are going to be poorer. They don't have 3,000 pounds uh, put away for their garden shed to be built by the end of the summer. They're just hungry. So when we come to phase, uh, to the end of phase one, a lot of people, and we've seen that historically in Germany, when people have to choose between, oh yeah, please, I can have some sense of safety and security, the bargain people are willing to strike can be extraordinarily high. So the question is, how long does it take to truthfully rewire society that will come to phase one and say, yes, we are ready to not go back to the old world, and yes, we understood, this can continue. Aeroplanes don't have to fly in, in, in that uh, number. The factories have to change. So I'm, I'm a bit, um, I want to believe this to, I believe this to be possible, but history has shown us that people will quickly go back to, you know, to anything that gives them a sense of safety and basic, basic income. We're talking about food and shelter for a lot of people. You know, yeah. look at America. It's just a complete disaster. Totally. Yeah, I mean, so it's, how, it's a... how, how to prepare the people when we talk about keep making activists out of those people, activating the perhaps already passive supporters and those who now become aware of this. Emergency is possible and comes down much faster the road. And that's what we've been talking about. Societal collapse can happen within a really short amount of time. And we talked about in the, in the context of climate breakdown, but this gives society taste. However, have you got an idea? How can we activate the minds of people to empower them to believe change is possible? We don't have to go back. We yeah. can build the impossible but possible future. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a really tough question because I think in some ways there's a time, there's a time for everything. And maybe there's, maybe that now is still not that time because I think that what's happening now, like I think that what's happening now is a lot of people still don't really understand what is happening. You know what I mean? So I think that what I would be focusing on now is like preparing people mentally and emotionally for what is, what is to come. So like there's a whole nother now, it used to be that the conflict was between the people in power. And now there's a whole third entity now, which is this virus and the virus can mutate and it can change its characteristics. It can do different things. It can do surprising things that we don't understand yet. Like suddenly, like we could have, it could mutate in such a way that, that the number one symptom is losing hearing, not fever or whatever. So we need to prepare people emotionally for what is possible, what could happen. Like, I think one of the things that 
so one of the things I did when I was younger is I spent, <laughs> it's kind of a weird anecdote, but I spent like, a, I, on, I went to weird. a library. Be a weird, be weird, Michael. Okay. So Please. one of my like preparations for whatever is when I was like, I guess I was like 21 or 22 years old. I was doing a lot of research in the library and I just like read all of the Holocaust books. And that's what I, that's what I did. I just was like, okay, I'm going to read this entire Holocaust section of this university library. And one of the things, the takeaway from doing that experience, not only was it traumatic, but the takeaway from that experience is a really important story of this one doctor who says that when the Holocaust started, he listened to the rumors, okay? And so he, he listened and he believed that there were death camps, whereas everyone else in the society was like, that's just rumors, it's not true. So when he finally, after whatever months, is taken to the death camp and he's about to enter into the death camp gates, he experienced, a, he described a split of consciousness where he's like, this is it, this is the death camp, I'm entering the death camp, I can survive this, right? In front of him in the line was someone who started to say, oh my God, it's a death camp, I can't believe this is actually a death camp, freaks out, and then the prison guard kills that person right in front of everyone. The story, the point of this story here is that we're about to enter a very dark time, I believe. And the best way to prepare oneself is to accept that it's a very dark time so that when it happens, we're okay. So I think that the first thing is like, is, is focusing on this question of, of emotional and psychological um, protection of ourselves through accepting that it's gonna be a very dark time and understanding that so there's an, actually an article on the, Lancet, on the flu mob site from The Lancet talking about how quarantine itself is a traumatic experience. And just the quarantine that we're experiencing now is going to cause PTSD. It just is. Um, and it's going to have long-term uh, implications in terms of our, our behavior. So they've done studies on people in quarantine before. And so, for example, after this experience, we're more likely to be... Um, to keep our social distance. We're, more, we're gonna be more likely to wash our hands. There's all these like these behaviors that we're gonna, that are just gonna happen. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, the time right now is still the time of protecting ourselves for, from what, how bad it could get so that when it, if it does get that bad, which I think it will, I really do think it will get very bad, um, we're still okay. We don't wanna lose ourselves by, by believing that it, and then there will be a time when we can do all that other stuff but for right now it's like we need to take care of ourselves emotionally and psychologically um yeah. yeah i think that's a really good point micah i think that's one of the reasons why it links really well with this work that we're doing at the moment with this online program a lot of it is about supporting people who are in isolation right now who are self-isolating it's like the program is filled with you know listening circles people's assemblies online people hearing people's voices at this time because like you say it's it's traumatic, right, for a lot of people. And it's like, these are the, the people we want to be protecting is our activists. And it's also a way I think that we can really help grow the movement is saying, look, we've got this online space. We want to hear what you think about these issues, right? We're not just saying, look, here's the, here's the media's take on all this, right? It's like, we want to hear your voices. So we're kind of hoping this is like the first week of the XR TV uh, online program, but over the next few weeks, we're going to build it up, try and get, you know, a few jingles and things <laughs> and really make it, you know, something fun and engaging, but also something that can support people in this time. And I'm wondering what else you think in terms of, I know in your book, obviously you're quite critical of uh, online activism, you know, clicktivism, that kind of thing. And I'm wondering what you see the future of, of that being at the moment when there are so many people who are coming online, if there's any potential there or if it's, it's still a, a useless effort. No, I mean, I think that, you know, I, like I said, I don't think we should just like take our old thinking and then just try to apply it. So I think that right now we are in a situation where, yeah, like our engagement with the public sphere is going to be mediated through the internet. Like that's just how it is. Like, but on the other hand, I think that we should also be aware of the fact that there really is no politics. Like their revolution, okay, war and these, and the, like this, this, this could create a revolutionary scenario. Absolutely, coronavirus could but it will not be during this moment. Like, I don't think there's no government in, like, it's just not gonna happen right now. Like right now, the people who are in power are gonna stay in power. So it's very difficult to imagine what we could actually do. I think that it's possible that the, like already in Brazil, they're kind of saying that the response of the government is so inadequate that they should resign or whatever. So it's possible that there will be that kind of stuff could happen. But again, um, we have to be honest, I think Netanyahu and these people have a point. Like, do we really want to switch governments right now? Like, I think it's, it's a kind of dangerous argument. So I guess what I would say is we have to think about what is the goal of the activism that we're trying to do? And I think that the first step there is to acknowledge that 
politics as we know it is over. We are in a state of emergency. We're in a suspension of, we're in a suspension of, of politics. Um, and so it's not quite clear what it is that we could do. I think that, yes, everyone right now is trying to create things like XRTV and, and you know, having a way for us to all kind of like be together, which I think is good. And I, but I also think that we, I agree with you that there needs to be some thinking about what else can we do, but I'm just trying to say we should also um, be reasonable. Like it might not be possible to actually influence mm -hmm. politics because politics might be over. So it's very difficult ex to accept that. But there's another realm uh, within XR. One of our pillars is regenerative cultures, which now is more important than ever. Although we can't come together physically, we can, for example, use this channel to um, share skills we have within the movement. We have um, faith communities who do daily meditation, talk about what does faith means in, in times like these, which is applicable, you know, towards the whole future we are seeing right now. Um, we have lawyers who could talk about the implications of emergency legislation. And we have um, the opportunity to understand the importance of deep adaptation and regenerative cultures, not just as a, oh, you know, I have a bit of region time, but actually let this sink in deeply, which includes looking after ourselves, our families, to, to make sure we don't fall into deep trauma, right? Yeah. So I think that Absolutely. is one of our strengths. Um, we can't go out and hassle the, the government right now because they need to do their job. And I don't envy any of them, however much I dislike them. Um, you know, we re rely on, on that uh, right now. Um, but then what about, you know, disease such as war is big business for a lot of people. So there will be folks who are earning a lot now. And if not, they are preparing once we come to the end of phase one to really cash in. And yes. I do see that we, and that goes along with, you know, how can we stop not falling back into the old uh, mechanism. I, I wonder if there is a way we can activate folks to say, and if we have to do that online, perhaps, to still rally for, um, you know, stop, stop uh, uh, trading uh, missiles and, and that whole, whole thing, looking into the uh, pharma lobbies you know, patent, patents on vaccines and all that palaver. And also, um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there needs to be leadership that needs to come from the people to be able to stand together once we can leave the house. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I agree with you that we should be honest that there's going to be like, there's a there's power struggle going on now. The people in power get to stay in power. Okay, fine. But there is also going to be people who are going to power struggle when this is uh, when the first wave peaks and there's a little bit of feeling of like that it's a little safer to go out. And so there's this actually this interesting, you guys should Google this, but there's right before this really hit, uh, there was a record number of CEO resignations. So the ultra wealthy across, it's a fascinating article, you should Google it. So more people, more CEOs resigned in like the first couple of weeks of this year than during the financial crisis. So Across the board, CEOs and ultra wealthy, I think their strategy is let's go, like, let's resign from our active positions. Let's wait. They're waiting. Let's protect ourselves. Let's try to reemerge later and have more power than we did before. They're doing the exact same strategy. And I think we should, we should be doing that strategy as well. But I also think that it's too early to tell because this virus is so contagious and so odd that we won't know for another two weeks really which world leaders are infected. So still there's like Pence could be infected, Trump could be infected. Like we won't know, in two or three weeks, we might find out that a lot of these people, they're gone. Like they're just not, they didn't make it. You know what I mean? So we don't know, I think it's still time. I think that things, I think that things are moving very quickly, but there's still so much to come. Um, and so I, I, I think that is really important. I think one of the things that XR can say that's like one of the few groups that can have a positive narrative right now is basically like, we're winning. Like this, this is ecologically, the earth is winning right now. And like, and it sucks and it's painful. I didn't want it to happen this way. I thought we were going to like 
create some sort of glorious mass movement that was going to get us to this point. But it turns out like this is happening faster. And in some ways, as long as we can, like you're saying, do regenerative culture and get like, get our, you know, p position XR as being like, this is actually kind of a good thing. And if we can mitigate the negative consequences as much as possible, which is like people getting infected and hurt and heal the ones that are, are infected and stuff like that, then we could end up as a social movement after this much stronger than we were before. Because I think a lot of people might say like, after this, for example, there's going to be a lot of traumatized individuals who don't want to be around other people. Already, like I've been in, uh, I went in early because I could see what's happening. I'm in New York State, which is the epicenter. Um, but already, like I was having some nightmares around being around other people. And I watched a TV show and I was like, they're too close together. Like I can already see in my mind that social distancing is like um, going to be a real deal after this. And so some people, some percentage of our population might say, I want to work from home permanently. I don't want to fly on airplanes anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, like we are, we are, we are winning. And I think the question is like, basically, what do we, how do we, how are we, how do we come out of this the strongest? And that's why I'm very reluctant to, I think mutual aid and all that kind of stuff is beautiful and great, but personally, and, and I would say, let other people do that. I think that they're being extremely naive about the infectiousness of this disease. I think this is, I think, I personally believe that this is a, um, probably a lab escaped virus. So th there's actually a really, that was like a conspiracy theory, but now there's a really good article in the uh, uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists that just came out a couple of days ago, exploring this. And there's a lot of experts who are like, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> it is really possible that this might not be a bioweapon, but it might be a, a virus that they were studying in a Chinese lab that escaped, which apparently has happened before. There have been viruses that have escaped from these labs. It's not an implausible scenario. Mm. So, so in that case, if we say that that's possible, then we would treat it with a little bit more seriousness than just like an infectious flu. And we'd say, okay, this could be something that is more dangerous than we know. And they've only been studying it for three months. I mean, we studied AIDS, like all these theories about how we're gonna have a vaccine are completely false. Like think about how long, they still don't have a vaccine for AIDS. They don't have a universal vaccine for the flu. This, this thing is mutating so much that each community has its own strain. They're able to tell how long it's been in your community because they could tell from the mutations that have happened. So you could get immunity to the strain that I have in New York. You could fly to the UK and get infected with a, another strain. In Iceland, they have a case of someone who was infected with two strains. Okay, so this is not, they're not gonna have a, vac they're not gonna have a vaccine anytime soon because if they vaccinate you against strain A, you get infected with strain B. Like, I'm sorry, I don't believe that they're gonna be able to do this. So yeah. I think that it's important to take this thing extremely seriously, which is what I've been doing. Um, and and like kind of orient around doing like if we take it extremely seriously then 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 that alters our our way of interacting with it yeah totally man i wanted to take a few of the questions from the chat to make this kind of a bit more interactive with the people who are the rebels who are tuning in so we've got one i think kind of links in a bit to what you were saying there so i just wanted to bring it up now which was um yeah, in the UK after world war one we got women's suffrage uh, after world war two we got the nhs what kind of progressive development um, can we be fighting for in the fallout of, of COVID? Um, what are your ideas around that? Yeah, it's a super good question. I mean, I think what's interesting is we already see it. We haven't even started fighting and we are already seeing tremendous amounts of like um, change. So in the US, for example, I'll give you a US example because I'm more tuned into that obviously, but um, they're doing this, this big stimulus package. And what's interesting in there is they're extending unemployment benefits. But what's interesting about this is they're extending it to gig workers and, and self-employed people. Right. This is unprecedented. Unprecedented mm -hmm. that you would extend, which is basically just saying like, just tell us how much you think you're going to make. Mm -hmm. Because how could you, you know, as unemployed, as a self-employed person, which is huge because that's a large part of the economy. And like, so I think that to me points to the possibility of, I think things like universal basic income are obviously possible and could be done. And, not, and can also be done in a way that's not tied to some imaginary salary income that you had before, like social security and all this kind of stuff, which is huge for me because I know my calendar is canceled. Like I, tra I used to travel a lot. It's canceled. You know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no traveling. So mm -hmm. I think one is this idea that like, that obviously universal basic income, I think is obviously something that could really be instituted. I think that we're already seeing things like work from home, all these, all of the kind of ecological behavior changes that we need, like, like we don't need to, to fly anymore. Everything's fine. Look, you know, <laughs> we don't need to go to conferences. So all this kind of stuff I think is really, is going to be really um, good. But I think there's, I think that the biggest challenge right now is that 
you know, effectively, and this is kind of what's, what's impacting my own thinking is like, that democracy itself seems to be like over. And I, it's just really like what, for me, that's really hard because I think that watching China uh, deal with this situation in, in their way that they did, such that now they claim they don't even have any new infections has left mm -hmm. me with this feeling of that I myself also drank too much of the American democracy Kool-Aid because there is something about the react. I mean, America is completely, I, I was watching in horror for two months as they didn't even test anyone. So by the time they even started testing people, like our country is just so infected that they had to tell people two weeks ago, they told people in New York city, just assume you've been infected. That's how, that's how, many people are infected in New York City. Just assume you've been infected. And if you left New York City, now you have to quarantine for 14 days. So it's really, I think, one of the biggest hits here is going to be, are we going to come out of this situation not really believing in democracy anymore, right? Because we can see democracy just being completely ill-equipped for dealing with this scenario. And if we don't believe in democracy anymore, what do we believe in? Do we believe in Chinese authoritarian to, you know, models? Are we going to come up with something else? What is it? So I think there's a lot of thinking that's going to happen around this question of like, letting go of some of that naive kind of like, oh yeah, like the people and mutual aid and like, like, I mean, maybe, maybe the mutual aid organizations are going to do such a good job that we're like, it's a new model, or maybe their leadership is going to get decimated with coronavirus and be gone in a month. And <laughs> it wasn't a good model. We will see. I hope that it is a good model, but I think that I tend to think that, no, I think that um, coronavirus is a social evolutionary pressure. And so we should, we should change everything. We should change our thinking around everything. We should, yeah, allow it to change our thinking around everything. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, we've got some other comments coming in. So this one's from uh, Jules. He's uh, saying, uh, you know, one of the things we've also been talking about a lot in terms of, you know, and things that are um, going to be disasters for the globe, but, you know, things like the food shortages. You know, talk about in your book as well, when, when food shortages happen, that's when serious social upheaval starts. And um, he's, he's asking in the, in the comments, you know, in the questions, uh, wouldn't it make sense for the community at this time to start figuring out and working how to grow their own food as a way of challenging this? And then also yes. there's a question around uh, if or when rationing is introduced, is that something we should be welcoming and celebrating or resisting? Look, I mean, I think that we, we are going to have to embrace the strategies that will allow us to eradicate coronavirus in our communities. The problem here is that it's more, it's most likely, what's most, the most likely scenario is that this new coronavirus is here forever, right? Because it could be, we have the cold, we have the flu, and now we have COVID-19. We have three like things that happen every season and we never really escape it. So on your first question, absolutely. Everyone should, everyone should have, in their homes, three months of food. If you do not have three months of food, then you should be accumulating slowly as much as possible food, delivery food. So in my, I know in my area, I discovered that there's a company that will ship you frozen foods, okay? So ship some frozen foods. There's a company that will ship you some bulk foods. Get some bulk foods sent to your house. And then there's a farm that's doing like CSA deliveries. Get that going to your house. Basically like we need to be like, everyone should be taking care of themselves and making sure that the people they know also have the supplies they need in case there is a supply disruption, because that is highly likely scenario. Even in China, despite all the positive news, they still have not fully restarted the factories. At last I checked, the, the, the traffic in Beijing is still about 25% of it was that it was before. So this is gonna have long-term implications. The factories have been now closed for like two months. Imagine all the things that were not made in those two months that are now being depleted around the world, right? And then we run out of, like in America, they've already said, they didn't make big news of this, but they already said there's at least one medicine. They won't tell you what the medicine is, but there's one medicine that has, that has shortage now. So there's probably at least more than one medicine. So basically, absolutely, I think that we need to be, this is not over and do not rely on the government. Um, everyone should have three months of food for them and their families in the house. And you should have a garden, absolutely. These are just obvious, like, this is stuff we do during war. It's brilliant. You should absolutely do it. And I think absolutely we should be working and supporting local farmers that can be doing delivering CSAs, all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. is a good idea. Mm, I think in the cool. UK, we have a scenario of 85% of our medicine comes from China. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, China. In, the, in the absence of that, um, what would make sense is to invest into, you know, skills to train new pharmacists who can 
make these medicines however they can because medicine is patented. Yes. You know, those well, big companies have patents on, on these, uh, like Bayer and, and all those. So that, that's a disastrous situation, really. Absolutely. I mean, I think, so, like, so if, if you are someone who is healthy right now and does not require medicine, um, then that's good. But if you get infected with coronavirus, the thing, the thing is, is that there's actually no active, effective treatment. Despite, right now we're in this, this the one of the narratives worldwide, is they're going to find a, a, a medicine. It's like, no, they're not. It's not going to find a medicine. So I think that one thing that we can do just on this topic of medicine is um, this is kind of an outlandish suggestion, but I think it could really help people is you can make yourself placebo pills. And the thing about placebo effect, if you Google this, there's a lot of research on this question is that placebo effect still works even when you know it's a placebo. And the, the benefit of placebo pills is it cannot hurt you. It can only help you. So you can make yourself, I actually made for my family. This is, I'll tell you what I actually, where is it? Oh, here it is. I made this to show you guys. I just made these, these placebo pills. You can see on there, it just says antiviral medicine, take as needed. And in here is some sugar pills. It's just powdered sugar in these pills, right? You just, you can take that and it can actually activate your body's immune system response. You can Google it if you think that's crazy. There's like articles from Harvard and stuff saying this is a real thing. In fact, people, in fact, people who have taken placebo pills in the early onset of colds have had a shorter duration of cold than not taking it. So in the end, what I'm saying is that we might be in a scenario where placebo pill is your only real medicine because coronavirus is, you know, it's, it's, it's having strange, it infects the, they've, so they found it in people's spinal cords and it, it, it crosses into your brain. There is no, there's not going to be any medicine in the, in the short term. But I'm not just talking about medicine for coronavirus. I'm talking about shortage of medicine for people who have an okay life quality now because right. they're able to take these medicines in the absence of this me of these medicines, particularly in the, you know, developed countries, we will actually realize how sick our countries are because a lot of these people that are out there are having a fine life. Um, they're only having a fine life because they are medicated, you know? Right. So, I mean, it's, it's a bit, it's, it goes a bit off, off trail, but when we talk about shortage, so one question I had when, um, so that we need to focus on community building in whatever way, even if we can only do this in an online way in order to be stronger when we come out of here. But there, is there also a need to still go into large scale, um, support the sort of large scale economic shifts? And that's a lot what we've been talking about. Um, we're talking about banks, um, main polluters, and all these organizations where we want to be active and not just allow them to, you know, continue, as we say, business as usual. We don't want that to happen. And right. people are at home now. So people's main concern is how am I going to survive with very little money potentially and isolated? But also we know that there will be a phase where we need to be uh, really, really alert. Yeah. And I think what I mean, I think that the part of the answer is to is to see the coronavirus as an agent of social change itself. So some we don't have we don't. This is a big part of my book. We don't have to like this is the whole proof. This coronavirus is the whole proof of a structuralism and, and theurgism. Right. Humans. Let, if, if the lab. OK. Ignoring the lab release theory. Let's just say it came from bats or whatever then this virus is doing more than we could do with our own actions. So even now in this moment, when we worry about the banks and these big polluters, maybe the coronavirus will take care of that problem for us. Like it itself is a social actor. So I think that it's, it's like we need to, I think what I'm trying to say is the painful answer is that we need to accept the limitations of what we can do in this time and prepare for when we will be able to do more. But right now, there isn't a lot we can do besides trying to keep ourselves uninfected and try to keep our member, our people and our friends sane <laughs> and not too traumatized from this experience. You know what I mean? But there is, and, and aside from that, unless you're working in an essential business, unless you happen to be a, a large scale farmer or, you know, something that's now essential, like you should be, yes, you should get, you got to be out there and helping or whatever. But for the rest of us, um, it's kind of like a, it's a, I think it's almost like a waiting game. 
it's a prep it's a time of preparation like we should identify the things that you wish you knew and like you should, it's time of study it's a time of meditation um it's a time of gardening absolutely so start working on those gardens <laughs> stuff like that i think there are some more more questions um robin will probably yeah, yeah. call in and sure, also, yeah. um, it, I, I would be interested to, at one point, um, hear a little bit more about the third pillar of uh, uh, FluMob, the logging the positive developments. Yeah. I think Robin has a few more questions to Yeah, I'll in. start with one of these and then we can go on to that. So I think people are questioning come, coming in about some of the things you're saying. Um, Mike, people are thinking about, okay, so we're thinking about protecting our, our community. We're also thinking about, you know, you know, stockpiling if, if we need to. Now, these are two things that potentially we also need to think about, do we need to think about the vulnerable in these situations as well, right? I mean, if we are protecting ourselves and not going out to protect others, what happens to the vulnerables in those situation? And then also, I guess with extreme, more extreme measures, you know, like everyone buying three or four months worth of food, people are asking, James asked in the chat, could you how do you balance the need for these extreme measures whilst also maintaining some sense of order and protection? Yeah. Well, I mean, part of the problem is that our governments, I think, especially the UK and the US are at the forefront of basically lying to our people in order to keep them from doing the social behaviors that they needed to do. So when I sent out the guy, an email to my network being like, here, here's an easy way to stockpile the food, the government also could have been doing that like they also could have been telling people. So now we're in a situation where it's a little bit too late. And you're right, it's very hard to imagine stockpiling that amount of food because it's just, it's difficult, right? So one way to do it is just to accumulate slightly, accumulate where you can, when you can, slightly more than you normally would. Okay, fine. Um, but I think that, I think that what I'm saying is that we should, we are not, we do not need to be the saviors for all people, unfortunately. Even though we are good people and we, and we do not wish harm on our neighbors, it is not our role, because we are not the government, to do large-scale food distribution as if this is a war. This is, this is a war, and they, they will, they, it is their responsibility, and they will provide food to people who are hungry. Because if they do not, there will be some serious social consequences. There will be, even in China, they've started distributing food. So I, I don't think that we should be careful. I think food is a very primal thing that we worry about. I think that I, I believe that they will they will solve this problem, you know what I mean? Um, and if they don't, then, and, and we're forced to like give people food out of our whatever stockpile, then we, then we would be in a better position anyways. But I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I see this tendency among people to kind of, there's like almost a desire to get infected. You know what I'm saying? There's something about this virus. One thing to think about this virus and all viruses is that viruses have a, um, they can have influence on your emotions and your thoughts and your feelings. So some people have said that they've had weird dreams. Some people say they feel depressed or whatever from this virus to getting infected. But also there's people, if you've seen these videos of people going out and trying to infect other people. There's people who are spitting on doorknobs. Have you guys seen this stuff? It's really wild. There's people on, spitting on doorknobs and elevator buttons. There's a case in Japan of someone who knew they had coronavirus, literally told their family, I'm going to a busy bar to infect others. That person just died a couple of days ago. So there's something about the virus that could influence people's behavior. And there's also something about quarantine that can influence your behavior, which is like, you just wanna go out. And so you start rationalizing it. Like, I'm going out to help. I'm going out to help. And it's like, are you? Are you really going out to help? Or is it just that you really are feeling stir crazy in your house? So we have to balance all of these things. And I think that this, the state should provide the services or it should collapse. Done, that's what it should do. The military should provide the services or the military should collapse. I don't think that we should pretend as if we are going to do those things. We don't have the resources or the technical capabilities. I mean, those, those masks are only supposed to be used like once and then you have to disinfect them or whatever. I don't have 370, 65 masks in my house. You know what I mean? In America, there are no masks. They told people not to buy masks and now there are no masks. So um, I, don't, I, I, I just wanna push back against this idea of being so noble that we are suicidal. There's gonna be a time when, yeah, absolutely, you are gonna to have to be noble, but I don't think that time is right now. Let's let the state do what they need to do. Sure, I guess it's part of the, it's also part of the mentality of activists, right? It's part of the savior, you know, yeah. idea. We can, we, can help, we can help everyone, right, in some way, but it's interesting to think about it in that, in that perspective. Now, we've got, we've got a little bit of time left, so I wanted to, we could finish with Dahlia's question there, but also I wanted to link in for one from Marina. And she's asking, you know, from your experience in 2008, you know, the crash 
and the movement around that. Is there anything you wish you'd done differently with a movement uh, that we could apply to a situation uh, like we're facing now? And maybe you can link that in a little bit to what um, the, the third pillar there about the flu mob. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because in many ways, I mean, I feel like in many ways, I'm either, I can't tell if I'm the most blessed generation or the most cursed generation. Because I was graduating, you know, I graduated college a little bit before the 2008 financial crisis, which has then wiped out everything. And then now I have two young children during coronavirus. And this is like the most, this is like 2008 times 10. I mean, the economy is just gonna continue to tank because there's just, who's buying anything, you know what I mean? So I think one of the lessons, there's two lessons from 2008 and obviously things are different now, so we should be careful. But one of the lessons is that it took from 2008 until 2011 for a social movement to really emerge. So there was time, right? So we don't have, so maybe this happens and maybe the real social movement eruption is gonna happen two or three years later. That's okay. That's the first thing. The third, the second thing is that there was a tremendous pressure to resume life as it was. And I think that that was the most, I, I actually feel even just traumatized about this idea of, of them suddenly trying to go back to the world as it was. I'm like, F that. This, let us all just treat this as the end times apocalypse that we, that we in, in our way wanted and refuse to go back. We refuse, I refuse to start going back to work. I refuse to get on the airplane. I refuse to have that world. Um, Cause I think after 2008, they really got everyone back on this idea of like, we need to get back to work, right? Like, and, and they did, we all got, we just like little servants getting back to work. Let's not do that this time. Let's just say like, no, that there's an old world and that's over and the new world. And some of the vestiges of the old world are still here in terms of the leadership until they get infected. That is Trump is obviously gonna get infected. He doesn't practice social distancing at all. The guy is completely naive about this virus. Um, and so if he continues to not be infected it's because they have some sort of experimental antiviral medicine from the you know their weapons labs or whatever who knows anyway so like i think that one be patient and two like refuse just absolutely it should be core tenant of everyone we are not going back they can pay us they can give us universal basic income all this stuff that's good that's good we are not going back so um in terms a, of the yeah. that's a prophetic message we're not going yes. to return to yesterday we this are is it embracing tomorrow and in it, and, in, and it's just more honest because i mean i have a four-year-old and a one and a half year old and now they're they're growing up in quarantine that think about the implication of our of these children people who are there's all these people in college it just it just stopped <laughs> college just stopped they might not college might the universities might not start again in september guys so there's all there's like we in some ways we can't go back and they're scaring us by pretending that we can't go back but i think it's i find it more liberating to be like we are not going back this is the new world that's the prophetic message and all of these and this experience is going to have a profound impact on how we behave from this point forward and so we need to amplify that while diminishing the negative consequences it's really important you should go to flu mob and read this report from lancet about the psychological impact of, of quarantine and really sober up about how like even if you think you're doing fine trauma we are all going to experience PTSD. It is just absolute. Mm. And we've got another question that came in about the kind of economic system. I mean, how do you see this affecting that? We've talked about democracy so far, you know, implications around that. Um, but what about the economic system? I mean, people, are, you know, Matteo in the chat is saying, look, COVID-19 has highlighted the failure of the health system. Um, you know, too much privatization, this kind of thing. Could this be the best time to push for the government to go beyond GDP? Um, is this the best time to start asking for you know, different ways of economics, more sustainable ways of economics? What do you think? I mean, sure, yes. But I mean, to your first point about, I think we should be careful by being, about being like, this virus proves that they failed and all this kind of stuff. Because yes, they did fail. But on the other hand, um, what's, what kind of society could have been prepared for this? Like, so you have a virus that 10% of people need uh, hospitalization in order to recover what society on earth is going to have 10 percent of their enough beds for 10 percent of their of their people in any given time so the only option that we did have was to suddenly build beds which they did in china and which has completely failed like there's it hasn't even happened in america at all um, even though they're talking about it so i mean i think i want to just be fair to them i don't think we were able to structure our society in order to be prepared for a pandemic at any time that's just how it works but so this larger question about what kind of economy, look how, how we don't know, it's, it's, it's insane. There's so much, think about all the industries that just can't work right now, that are legally prohibited from working right now. Restaurants, like it's just, it goes on and on and on. Like 
massive, I mean, even in America, the Trump administration is saying, okay, maybe 30% unemployment, 30% unemployment. That's their estimate. And it's, it is crazy. And I think that's fair because if we look at our individual calendars, I know my calendar after today is again, completely empty. I have nothing else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, everything that I was going to do has been canceled for good reason. So that is, I think that is really hard to imagine what's going to happen next. I think that what I anticipate is going back to this core idea from the WHO is to, is that in the first wave of the pandemic, our resources will be exhausted and then the second wave will happen. So right now we're exhausting our resources, $2 trillion stimulus pack package in the U S. Okay. How many times can they do that before they're exhausted once, twice? Okay. Other countries are also throwing money at this problem. Eventually there will not be the government resources to, to keep doing this. That will be exhausted. So I think we should just see everything that we have right now is that all of the resources we have are being thrown at the problem. Those will be exhausted. The problem will still exist. So in terms of what economy we're going to have, who knows? Who knows? Absolutely. It's impossible to know. But what we do know is that we are in unprecedented, uncharted times. And everything that we're seeing now is just the, the expected exhaustion of the resources that we have. Mm. Well, Michael, you're at, uh, we've been an hour, but you just said that you've got a bit more time today, maybe. So do you mind carrying on for a bit, little, little bit longer? Sure, let's do it. Yeah, we've got more questions coming in. Okay, great. So you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, okay, well, we're not going to go back to business as usual, right? We're not going to go back to work. People are asking, is this time to be thinking about some kind of global, uh, global strike, some kind of global planetary strike? And uh, what do you think about that as a, as, a, as a tactic for activists? I think it's a good idea because like right now, <laughs> this is insane, but I believe it's a third of the world is in lockdown or something insane. Okay, so we are effectively on strike right now and they can't force us to leave our homes. So I absolutely agree that we're like, in terms of a global strike, we're in a very good position right now because if we just refuse to go back to work and out of our homes, <laughs> um, then they are in a bad position. What are they gonna do? Like take us out of our homes? Well, what if we're infected? It, as we saw in China, what they actually did is lock people in their homes, stay in your home. Um, it's very hard to people force people out of your home. So. I think that we should be doing that. I think that we should, um, I think that we should refuse to go back. I think that we should be pushing for as much like financial relief now to further exhaust the resources of the state and that we should be careful not to then dissipate those um, resources that were given. We should be very, everyone should need to be very careful with, with money right now because it's likely that um, we could experience for the first time in our life, lifetime deflation where there just simply is less money therefore money becomes more valuable. Um, if you think about how much the stock market has lost, there simply is just less money in the world, right? Coming, people have less of it, they're getting paid less of it. So I think a global strike is a, is a great idea. I think that it has to be paired though with a kind of positive vision um, because we can't go on strike and then just say, uh, give us universal basic income, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's kind of like, and people are like, why? Like, you know, um, but it has to be paired with something like, that this is actually better, you know, it's better that we, whatever, et cetera. So there's like a second part to the strike that needs to be figured out, but I like the idea. Well, it could, it could work with this idea of if we get universal income, we as a society, as activists, we are here to work really, 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 really hard to make change happen. You know, right. people, will be willing it's like the post uh second world war the rebuild of europe right. i mean I, i'm from europe and of course this happened in 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 england as well people were working so hard all together to rebuild and right. i think it could work in that conjunction yeah i like that point i mean i think another thing to keep in mind though too is that so <laughs> um during the there's sorry more dark stuff but during the black death when civil, you know, societies were decimated. There's been some interesting research about how many people can die in a society and the society can keep going. So I think during the Black Death, um, 30, like, I think that something like 30% of the population remained, but still society kept going. They were still like, had a mayor, they still had taxes. So we also need to not overestimate, we need to not underestimate how resilient the status quo is. Like, even if 50, 60% which isn't probably gonna happen with coronavirus, but even if 50 or 60% of all of everyone died, there would still be tax collectors, the government, 
they've still so there is there is going to be a need to just we can't just wait for it to collapse like there is going to be some effort to make to to push and and the question is when and how and i like the idea of of linking it to a demand like universal basic services or income or whatever um the other thing to keep in mind is that after the black death there was a tremendous economic boon um because even in america we're seeing like like some you know uh, one of our wholesale grocery stores or whatever is raising the minimum wage two dollars, right? So people like this will happen in the Black Death too. People who were like just average, you know, laborers started getting paid more and more <laughs> because they became vet more and more valuable. So, in some ways, this this could result in a, a positive economic situation for people who who previously were devalued and worth and worth less. Mm, yeah, I think there's something else coming in on the chat as well. People are talking about well. You know, if, if there's only these jobs right now that are essential work, what's being called essential work, and everyone else is going home, what are, you know, what is the future of for jobs, right? I mean, David Graeber's got a great book about bullshit jobs, right? People starting to question what it is the work we should be doing in our, in our society. And um, yeah, I mean, what you, what's the purpose of the rest, right? <laughs> totally. Yeah, and I think not only that, but like, there's a whole tremendous categories of jobs that simply can't be done because they require such specialized uh, equipment and skills that are unavailable right now. So like, it's not just people who are out of work because they work at restaurants. It's also people who are out of work or not working because they work on space probes. So they already this, I'm, I'm into space. So already this year since coronavirus, um, they, Europe has had to delay their Mars mission, which is huge. If you think about it, the billions of dollars that have been put in, you only can, you only can launch uh, Mars probes every two years. So they've been planning for this for two years, all the money. They also, there's a satellite that they had to put into standby because not enough scientists could go into the mission control. So there's just like whole categories of advanced civilization that are also being sidelined. And there's a, and it is a really big question now for us in civilization is like, the reason why this is kind of like a dark ages is because there's gonna be like, there's zero progress. If you think about it, scientific progress, there's zero progress in, in certain advanced areas right now because it's just, they can't go into their labs that's also gonna have these kind of impacts. So it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's, the impacts are being felt top, all the way to, from the top, all the way to the bottom in terms of people who are unable to work, unable to do their essential skills. Um, and so one answer is to like repurpose those skills, but I think that that in itself is not sufficient. If you spent your entire life becoming a PhD in astrophysics in order to do space probes, and then you, know, you can't, it's not so easy just to say like, do something else, you know? I would like to hear in these dark times, Micah, no pressure. Is there anything you're hopeful for? Um, and you obviously very consciously put this third pillar into your, into the FluMOP project to lock positive developments because within this terrible um, time, Sometimes we talk about what are the silver linings, which is, you know, a bit sort of, what well, can I talk about this? But the silver lining is, you know, I go out and there are no aeroplanes in the sky for the first time. It's just the sky. The birds in my garden are singing beyond, you know, anything they normally do right now. But of course, my kids have to be at home. They can't see their friends. You know, they're seven and 12. How is that clicking with them? But there, there are silver linings and you see how um society is is strapped away of all the bullshit and suddenly we ask you know who really matters to me what really matters to me and it's sort of resetting ourselves so what what are your hopes and and perhaps some of your silver linings um personally and or as an activist as a father um yeah, yeah. i'd like to hear it. Yeah, I mean, I think there there are there are silver linings. I think one of the one of the really big silver linings is is just e ecologically. I mean, this is such this is such a positive thing ecologically. I think you're right to talk about the birds. I can already see the impact on the wildlife around me. There's like yesterday I watched four or five deer just like just they were so. I mean, we have I've seen deer here usually just like one or two and a little bit more skittish. They were like had no care in the world. They stood they just hung out for like 30, 45 minutes eating everything in my backyard. They were like, this is great. They feel no fear. And it's like, we're going to see that across the board, a tremendous resurgence of wildlife, just like coming back because think of all the wildlife who are not getting hit by cars right now, et cetera. So 
that's that is a really a really positive silver lining. So on the ecological front, I think that we can be happy that right now we are achieving everything we wanted as environmentalists. That this is higher, this is better than our wildest dreams. If we if we thought about blocking one airport before, well, surprise, surprise, way more airports are being blocked than that. You know what I mean? So I think I saw something that something like of the 3,800 flights that were scheduled to go into China right now, only 700 are actually going into China. That's a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment and achievement. Um, it comes with a lot of pain. I'm not trying to down, downplay it, but that we can be positive about the ecological side. I think we can, I, so I think that's one good thing. And I think that we can also be positive that there is a possibility that this, I think, I think that it's likely that society as we know it will not be able to uh, defeat the coronavirus. So one positive lining is that this is going to, and it might not be a revolution in a, in the sense that of, you know, 20th century revolution, but I, I do think that this is going to lead to a revolutionary change in our societies. Unclear in which direction or how that'll look, but I, I think that it's, it's highly likely. Um, I mean, the, the Trump administration is so inept at dealing with this scenario that it, it's not unlikely that they will not, that America as we know it is not going to survive. Um, so that's positive. It's positive that things are, that change is more possible now. I think it's also, I think on a personal level, this has been great for my children. Like they like going to school, but I having them home can see them developing faster. I can see my, 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 my daughter learning words faster because she's hanging out with us more. Um, my son is, he says he's happy. I think they're happier, honestly. So I don't know. I think that we should, that this is a really bad and scary time. The other positive thing is just once you've been in isolation for 14 days, then you're not going to get sick. Probably you're just not going to get sick. So that's a good feeling or it's lucky that this is a, um, a respiratory illness that can't travel through walls. If we were dealing with like a nuclear fallout, well, it can, there are, there are other types of, of scenarios where we would be in lockdown and much more terrified. So it's good that this is only something that you can catch from other people and they have to be within a certain distance and all this kind of stuff. So I think that's positive. Yeah, you're quite right about the children. Um, my older son, Jonah, who's 12, basically does a 35 hour week in the school with a thousand other kids, which is so manic. I mean, he's this open vessel that just is force fed knowledge, which he enjoys that. And it's a little bit difficult for him right now, the transition, but I, I really uh, notice, um, and I know from when I homeschooled him whilst we were traveling in Mexico, the change, so just having time to, um, to blossom, there is something to be said about that, about all the families that are suddenly together, you know, the fathers, the mothers that are back home now for dinner and lunch, you know, and the proper breakfast and all of that is certainly, um, there are civil lines. So if I were to ask you, Micah, coronavirus gone, open the door, what would be the number one thing you would be doing that you can't <laughs> be doing? right now um there's no coronavirus no risk of infection no nothing it's all great it was a bad dream it was a bad dream you woke up it's all over. i'm like already so traumatized i can't even imagine it um <laughs> what would i do i i don't know honestly i'm like i don't even want to entertain that idea i'm sorry i feel like i feel like the the coronavirus is here to stay mm. and we're going to just have to, I think what's going to happen is that they're going to say, okay, we're, we're like Wuhan, we're lessening the we're quarantine. Everyone gets to go out, get some fresh air for three weeks. Okay. We're putting the quarantine back on. Sorry guys. Like, I think this is like, I think this is the new normal. I'm just trying to accept it as much as possible. I think that what this is, is like, it's like we need coronavirus for humanity to reach the next level. I, I, I believe that. I think there's something about the coronavirus and the social response that it's engendering that is going to be crucial for whether it's, long distance space travel or like this is this is forcing us to harden our societies like we shouldn't have to stop civilization because of a because of a flu like we shouldn't so i don't know i don't i don't i mean i i wish i could go for a walk and kind of stuff like that but i already i have been yeah just the idea of being around other people like i talked to my neighbor like 40 feet away and i was like for, for four days like freaking out so I'm happy where I am right now. <laughs> I think um, in Bristol, 
without doubt, not even the slightest, we would have a massive epic party with lots of <laughs> big hugs, <laughs> dance breaks, basically one dance break into the next and, and all together touching each other whilst we're dancing yeah. like crazy. It's, it's I, I think that would happen. It's tricky for rebels, you know, we're, we're big huggers. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, we'll, we'll find a way through this. We've got each other cool. online here. So, um, Michael, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. It's been really, uh, it's been really interesting, really like, illuminating to hear your thoughts on this and that you've been so sharp to it from such an early stage by the sounds of things after we, after we spoke last. And, um, yeah, I wanted to invite any final words you might have before we want to wrap up if, you, if you've got any. Otherwise, um, yeah, lovely to speak. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I think I said everything I want to say. I would just say that, like, um, this, you know, everyone should just prepare themselves emotionally that it, that the worst case scenario will keep to unravel because it's been the worst case scenario now for three months. So um, the virus is doubling every three days. It's moving so quickly. It's, you know, so we should just keep hardening yourself, keep preparing yourself, use every opportunity to keep preparing yourself. Don't give up. This is like a long haul. This is going to be a long haul. So don't, don't loosen the guard, even though we want to, even though the nice weather's coming, you just got to keep keep staying strong. We want to protect as many XR people as possible so that our proportion of the population is greater after this is than it was before. Amazing. Thanks, Micah, so much. And, and Dahlia, thank you so much for your time as well. And thanks for everyone who came along. We're doing uh, more of these online programs, online shows. We've got Chris Hedges on tomorrow. Um, and we've got uh, uh, Paul Mason, um, economist, on on Saturday. Uh, just go on to the... Our, uh, our website to find out more about all the online events that are coming up uh, alone together. That's what we're working on. All right. Thanks so much, can everyone. I, Thank can you. I send Bye. love and courage? Can I send love and courage and blessings? Of course. And you can still dance in your kitchen. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Micah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.